Are you tired of the endless tinkering and tuning of your new 3D printer? In this video, discover the 5 essential tips to streamline the setup of your new machine and start your project sooner. The reason I'm putting this as the first tip here is because before we even start doing anything else on the printer, if your belts are not tight enough, you'll continue having errors and layer shifts on your prints no matter what you do on the rest of these steps. I can't tell you how many times I went crazy trying to tune every little thing on the printer just to keep getting layer shifts only to find out my belts were not tight enough. Save yourself the time and future hassle and just tighten your belts first. It's not about having the belts as tight as possible. This will actually make it harder for your stepper motors to move. I recommend downloading an app that can measure frequencies. On Android, there's conveniently one that is for tightening belts specifically, which all that means is that it records a sample of data and just tells you the frequency, but anything that can measure frequencies will do. On a Core XY printer like my Hypercube, each side has a side where the belt connects to a toothless pulley. Those are the sides you want to move your carriage to, to actually strum each belt, just like a guitar. As you tighten the belt, they change the note or frequency that they resonate at. I tune mine to a frequency roughly 120 Hz per belt. It is very important that both belts resonate at the same frequency or you will not get square prints. It doesn't have to be the same frequency as mine since your printer will have a different belt length. You want to find the balance to where both belts are tight enough to where the steppers don't skip and loose enough to where you're not causing extra friction for the steppers. It's a tricky balance and will most likely take a few tries to get it right. Be sure to do a test print like a calibration cube to see if you'll get layer shifts or tilting. Most of the problems I see with people who are new to 3D printing and having trouble getting their first successful print is leveling the bed. The print surface needs to be as flat as possible relative to the print head so that the melted plastic sticks to the bed as it's being put down. If the bed is not leveled, then at the lower points in the bed, the printer will effectively be printing in the air and have nothing to grab onto. So here's how you do it. Most printers these days have leveling knobs at the bottom corners like these. The best way I found is actually not using the paper method like you may have seen, but instead using a flashlight. Here's why. When you're leveling your bed, you're telling your printer where zero is. And if you use the paper method, zero will always be off by the thickness of the paper. Here's how you do the flashlight method. I'll show you on my Hypercube. I don't have knobs, but it's the same process. Home the printer first and manually make the bed go to each corner. If you're on Clipper, you can make a macro that does this, or you can use the built-in screws adjust macro that comes with Clipper. For that, you just have to tell it where your bed screws are using the coordinates on the XY plane. Once you're at each corner, jog the printer down by slowly incrementing it by one or 0.1 millimeters, depending on how close you are to the bed. The objective here is to get to the boundary between the nozzle touching and not touching the bed. Here's where the flashlight comes in. What's thinner than light, right? Shine the flashlight behind the nozzle and use your eyes to see if the nozzle fully blocks the light or not as shown here. Once the light is being blocked, go back up 0.1 millimeters just to double check, then go back down 0.1 millimeters as needed. This is to avoid being too close to the bed and actually pushing the bed down without realizing. Once you do this, repeat these steps for each corner of the bed and then run the process again a second time just to make sure nothing moved and do some fine adjustments as needed. This process seems lengthy here because I'm showing you step by step how to do it but when you do it once you'll never forget it and next time you'll do it much faster. Besides, if you do this right, you won't need to do it again for a long time unless you make some sort of hardware change on the printer itself. Now depending on your print bed material, it's possible that even after leveling your bed manually, your bed is not perfectly flat. This is why a lot of printers use glass as the print bed because glass is a very flat surface and it is extremely rare for glass to have any dents or bends in it. Aluminum beds can be slightly warped every time due to constant heating and cooling cycles. This is where auto bed leveling can come in really handy. Because if your bed only has minor warping in it, then you can use auto bed leveling to automatically adjust the Z height of the print head as it's being printed to account for the slight differences in the bed. Once you set up the hardware, it is actually really simple to do. I'll show you how to do it in Clipper as it's the easiest way to set up automatic bed leveling without having to reflash your firmware in Marlin. Here's how to do it. Firstly, plug in your auto bed leveling sensor. I'm using a CR Touch here due to its metal probe and better build quality than the BL Touch in my opinion. 
I'm using a BTT Octopus V1.1 board and the place to plug it in is here. Make sure the wire colors are like this shown in the diagram here. Then go into your clipper printer.cfg file and add the BL Touch section. This only applies to BL Touch style probes but also works with the CR Touch. Copy my settings for basic config to start with and make sure the probe pin is correct, which you can find by looking at the BTT Octopus pinout if you're unsure. Once you set up the clipper config, simply restart the firmware, then home your printer and press the calibrate button on the height map section of clipper. This will then begin the probing process on the bed and create a mesh that will be used to automatically adjust the Z height during printing. At this point, you'd be ready to print on most printers, but if you really want to get super smooth sides, faster print times, and accurate prints, stay tuned for the last two steps, and if you like what you see, then comment, like, and subscribe for more content like this. What the hell is input shaping, right? It's a weird name they gave it, and it's not exactly self-evident of what that even means just by looking at it. But basically, input shaping allows you to use an accelerometer to find the resonant frequencies of your entire printer on each axis. A resonant frequency is basically the point where frequencies share a node at the same point and so their amplitudes add up. This is what causes your entire printer to physically move and vibrate a lot when you're printing fast. Finding the resonant frequency allows the firmware on the printer to automatically account and correct for it so that you can print with higher accelerations while reducing any ringing artifacts like the ones you see here. Once you set this up like how I'm about to show you, recalibrating input shaping in the future will be as easy as plugging your custom made cable into the accelerometer and running one command. So here's how you do it. Grab yourself an ADXL 345 or an ADXL 343 accelerometer for cheap on Amazon. Link will be below. And plug it in with the following wiring diagram. We're going to be using SPI directly from the Raspberry Pi to talk with the accelerometer. You will have to create your own cable for this, which will require some basic electrical skills, which you'll 100% be able to do if you're watching this video. You want to make sure you rigidly mount the accelerometer to your print head with screws. Here's one STL file that was designed for the Ender 3. For this specific model, just remember that you do not need to turn the heater on when using it. You only need to home the printer to run input shaping with it. To install the software, SSH into your Raspberry Pi and enter these commands, which will install some necessary Python libraries that Clipper will use to process the ADXL data. Next, follow these steps on screen to set up your Raspberry Pi as a secondary MCU so that the ADXL utilizes the processing power of the Pi instead of the main board. Finally, make sure you have SPI enabled by typing raspy config with an underscore in it and enabling SPI under interfacing options and then fill in your printer.cfg file like how I have it here. You can modify your probe points so that it's in the center of your bed in XYZ format. Once you have set up the software side of things on the Raspberry Pi, then save and restart, home your printer, and run this command, shaper underscore calibrate, and the printer will do the rest. The results will lay out recommended accelerations, which you can usually start with the second or third option from the top. But if you're unsure, you can run an acceleration test with the input shaping tower model, which I'll link below. This will give you an idea of what accelerations work best for your printer. Just keep in mind that as you go to faster speeds, you will need to increase your nozzle temperature to keep up with the flow. And the limiting factors here will mainly be how fast your printer can push and melt filament through your nozzle. So make sure you have a good extruder with a lot of torque and grip and a hot end with a large melting zone. I'm using a Sherpa mini extruder and an E3D Volcano hot end. You'll always be able to print with faster speeds on a 0.4mm nozzle than with larger nozzles. But larger nozzles can make up for that loss of speed with the increased volume of material they can actually put down per second. For example, I'm using a 0.8mm nozzle on my Harbor Cube, and even though I have to drastically lower the speeds from 250 to 60 millimeters per second, for it to print with good quality, I'm still able to print large objects in half the time because it's outputting more material at a time than what a 0.4mm nozzle can do. This is one that a lot of people don't know about, but I highly recommend. By using this simple model, you can make your prints much more accurate. The way it works is that we print out the model and see if the two pieces fit together. If they don't, then we adjust the material flow rates, typically somewhere between 90 and 100% until they fit. Really spending some time fine-tuning this will make a huge difference in consistently getting accurate parts that fit every time. So there's kind of a second part to the S-shape test. It's not just for fitting together the two pieces. It can also be used as just a general test print that you can use to see if your prints are wobbling to the side or if you have layer shifts. So 
it, when you get to this point, it can be a good indicator of if you got the other steps right, like tightening the belts. If you don't get the tightening of the belts right, it's going to be a problem later on. So there's a highly good chance that you're going to end up having to go back to that step and tightening your belts again. It's really important to get the belt tension right. I can't stress that enough. I retuned this printer just for this video and the belt tensioning <laughs> was the major part that was messing up the prints, right? But like I said before, once you do these steps, your machine will be ready to go to start the projects you want. All right, those were my five essential tips to streamline the setup of your new machine. If you really like this video, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. Check out my other videos for more 3D printing content. Thanks for watching and go make something.